I have a few announcements before we get started. I think it's on the 26th, which is a few Sundays from now, uh, we're going to have our annual business meeting, and it, we have it immediately after the service, and it's only lasts about 10 minutes. So if you have 10 minutes to spare, you can be part of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, we we love Garth, I'll tell you. He's one of a kind, for sure. Also, um, we're going to have a birthday celebration on the 19th, which I believe is next Sunday. And we're not going to the nursing homes today. Uh, I, <coughs> excuse me. I had that a uh, week off, but it really makes it better because on the, it'll be on the 19th, which is when we're going to have the party, and uh, the first nursing home will be at 2:30. So we have plenty of time to party, and then we'll go to the nursing homes. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else here. Here. You may have gotten one of these in your bulletin, so I hope that you will be with us to celebrate. Let's prepare ourselves this morning in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we are the we are the people of God, the royal family, and we are here in order to grow in grace and knowledge. We're here to be fed by your word. We're so thankful that we can understand your word because it's not a talent. It's not something that uh, we have to learn. We can understand the whole realm of doctrine uh, because of the great system of perception whereby we can understand the entire Word of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is our mentor. He is our true teacher. So we thank you for all these things and pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this morning for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to <clears throat> excuse me, Exodus chapter 8 and verse 24. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 24. Chapter 8 covers the different different types of, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, let me go back here. I meant to say chapter 7, verse 24. And verse 7 deals with the power of God turning the Nile River into blood. This was the first time the Egyptians saw what God could do. And verse 24 says, So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. So it appears that they had to dig a source of water that was underground 
because all the water that came from the Nile would, was putrid, it was uh, turned to blood. So can you imagine going out and digging wherever they could uh, to get water that they could drink? And I imagine, I don't know that, I envision them getting shovels out there and digging, trying to find water. Water is something we all have to have. I can remember, I don't really remember what year it was, it's probably, oh, I guess at least 30 years ago, we had a, a freeze in the Brenham area that it was below freezing for over a week. And I have a tank, some people call it a pond, that froze. And I had, and it was so, it was about uh, six or eight inches thick. You could walk on it. And I had two cows. And I called the vet, I said, uh, uh, I don't have any water, my well is frozen up, and my well, is, I mean, my tank is frozen, and my cows are very thirsty, what should I do? He said, get a big sledgehammer and get out there and get with it. Okay. <laughs> so I went out there and took a sledgehammer right there close to the shore, and I started hitting. I got, I got about a, no, lo, no bigger than a one-foot circle, somewhere about there. And as soon as I backed off, those cows went in there and just drove their snouts down into that water. They were so thirsty. I don't know why that made me think of that when the Egyptians were trying to find water. But when you don't have water, you're in serious trouble. And so, uh, they, they, they could only get water that was not from the Nile. And then verse 25 says, and seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Now, what that tells us <laughs> is that you had to go seven days before the River Nile, I would assume, would go, get back to normal. And so you'd have to be out digging in the dirt wherever you could to get water and then haul it to your house. That was, you know, when you think for, maybe you could get by with that, you could do it for two or three days and four days, five, six, seven days. That would get anybody's attention. So that's how chapter 7 ends. And then we go to chapter 8. And what we're going to see in chapter 8 is the second plague is going to be with frogs. Now, most people like myself like critters. I don't know of many women that like frogs. Little boys like to play with them, but <clears throat> they're not the most attractive animal there is or creature. And they do. And what I found out was if you see one and you think it's kind of cute, I would think twice before picking it up. Some of you are laughing and you know why. Because most of the time when you pick up a frog, you're going to be looking for a Kleenex or a rag or something. Let me just put it that way. So they're not the most friendly creature. And so we see in uh, verse 8, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we'll comment. Exodus chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Now you'll remember the plague happened. I mean, the, uh, after the Nile, it was turned red, and maybe I would assume that the Egyptians thought, "Wow, whew, that was pretty tough. I'm sure glad it's over. Now we can get back to normal." Well, seven days passed, and here they are knocking on Pharaoh's door again. Verse two. But if you refuse. To let them go, behold, I will smite you with the whole territory with frogs. And the Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house and into your bedroom. And yes, on your bed, 
and into the houses of your servants and on your people and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. Now, how many people like to sleep with frogs? Verse 4. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all servants. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers and over the streams and over the pools and make frogs come out on the land of Egypt. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There was always a lot of frogs, but they pretty much stayed in the water. But now... Because of this plague, God is, God is not only going to have them come out of the water, but there's going to be a lot more frogs than there normally is. Verse 6. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. So the second plague was a supernatural abundance of frogs who would plague the people. The Lord would tell Moses what to say and he would, and it would happen. So Moses would tell Pharaoh and he would continue to defy God's command. Now we knew this going in. Seven times, right off the bat, some, the place would happen and Pharaoh would harden his heart. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm Pharaoh. He considered himself as a God as well as people as well. Love that. Verse 7. And the magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may remove frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And then verse 9. And Moses said to Pharaoh. The honor is yours to tell me when shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses that they may be left only in the night. Now there's a few things we have to look at here. First of all, the magicians copied what happened again. They did it with the staff that was thrown down, and they uh, made a fake one. And the staff ate, I mean, turned into a serpent. And uh, Moses' rod that became a serpent ate the other two serpents. Uh, Sir, that was a bummer for them. And then we have... When in this second second case, they're making more frogs. Now, if they could do away with frogs, they might have something. Because what the last thing that people wanted was more frogs. And the only thing they could come up with is more frogs. I would imagine they weren't the most popular people in the land when they bring in more frogs. It just shows their limitations. Now, verse 8, you find out that Pharaoh was entreating the Moses and Aaron uh, to remove the frog from the people. And then it, and it even says, I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Now, we've never been run over with frogs. I, I don't think anybody has was forced to have to take the frogs out of your pots before you could cook or have them in your bedroom or in your bed. One thing they don't say here, say anything about, is the fro noise that frogs make. Here you got, you, have, you might have a hundred slimy frogs on your bed. You think, I'm going to grit this out. I'm going to go to sleep then. I, I don't know how they do it. I can't make the sound. But I didn't, I would imagine there wasn't much sleep of those days. And even if you went out on outside, frogs were all over the ground. They were all over the place. So it was so bad that Pharaoh relented and said, okay, 
in verse 8, uh, ask the Lord so that he will remove the frog from me and from my people. I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Now, there's a little, little caveat in there. He didn't say how far he would let them go. He just said he'd let them go. And we'll see how that plays out in a bit. So this time Pharaoh, Pharaoh promised that he would comply with God's command to let people go if he would remove the frogs. This was a sign that Pharaoh regarded the God of Israel as the author of the plague and that he was more powerful than the false gods of Egypt. This We're only on the second uh, plague and he's throwing you in the towel. But he's such a cantankerous and uh, loathsome person. He has no character. It's going to go on and on, and mainly because he's so stubborn and he he's so arrogant that he's going to let these other continue to happen. And in verse 9, Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours to tell me when shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from your you and your houses that they may be left only in the Nile? This, who, who understands what it means? The honor of yours is to tell me. What does that mean? Well, Moses was really very humble and rather him saying the time when this was going to take place, he gave the choice to Pharaoh. He, he figured it was God's job to tell Pharaoh when this was going to happen. And so he just passed it along the decision as to when these frogs are going to be uh, destroyed or put back in the river. And it was something that was... Uh, really thoughtful on his on his part. So, to give God the glory, Moses placed himself below Pharaoh and left him to fix the time for the frogs to be removed through his decision. Now, if it was me, or if it was you, and you had this frog business going on, and someone said, look, uh, if you, he's already said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let the people go. I'm going to comply. So Moses says, okay, when do you want this to happen? Wouldn't we say, how about right now? How about immediately? But for some reason says, no, we're going to have to spend another night sleeping with frogs and we do, it would happen tomorrow. By giving the Egyptian king this power of timing, it kept him from alleging that the frogs would go away due to simple consequences of natural processes or by the false gods of the Egyptians. So if, if Moses hadn't given him the power to make that decision and God changed it, well, Moses, I mean, the Pharaoh could say, oh, well, th that was just going to happen anyway. It's just a coincidence. Or he would say that the he, the... Gods of Egypt are the one that really stopped this from going on. But he said the time. So that ruled out all these other things that he would come up with. Also, it demonstrated that the frogs swarmed over the land and were removed from the land solely by the sovereignty of the God of Israel. And no matter how he tried to paint it, that's what happened. Verse 10, then he said, tomorrow, so he said, may it be, that would be Moses, uh, so he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. So he took away all these, maybe it happened this way, maybe they did it or whatever. He's saying, no, this, you, this is to show that you know that no one is like the Lord our God. Verse 
Verse 11. And the frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses and the frogs died out of their houses, uh, the courts and the fields. So they piled them up in heaps, and the land became foul. Huh. I don't know what should be worse, living with them or smelling them after they died. Billions of frogs stinking at the same time, and they had to pile them up and uh, burn them. Uh, I don't think burned frogs smell that good either. Flesh burning, you know. So... It happened verse uh, <coughs> excuse me. verse thirteen, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses and the courts and the fields. So they piled them up in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that they were there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Of course, this would be expected of someone who knew not God and thought he was a God. He has no character. And he went back on his word. Once the frogs were destroyed, Pharaoh hardened his heart again. This demonstrated that he was a liar like the devil who was controlling him. The devil is the father of lies, according to the Bible. And that was who was controlling Pharaoh. Now in verse 16, we have the third plague, which is gnats. Gnats. Verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. And they did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on the, gnats on man and beast, all the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. Now, the gnats were, they believe, a species called Cynephesis. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this. I'll spell it for you. S-C-I-N-I-P-H-E-S. Does anybody know how to pronounce that? Okay. Anyway, they were a species of gnats so small as to be hardly visible to the eye, but with a sting which, according to, uh, according to Philo and Origen, caused a most painful irritation to the skin. Have you ever been, have you ever been at a ball game or been outside at a, a picnic or something? Doing that, we just think if there are so many that they're like dust. I know you ladies are good housekeepers, but if you have the sun coming in at a proper angle and you look and you see the dust, right? That much dust. That's what the gnats were like. I remember, I guess I was about 14, I went to the to Galveston, and a good friend of mine, well, you may know, he's been here before, Paul Salzger, and uh, we were out in, on the water's edge, and there was some water that was a little bit beyond, just right out there at the beach, maybe 30, 40 feet, and there was dead water just sitting. And he thought, well, 
We normally go around that, but we're in a hurry. Let's go through that this time. And it had these uh, reeds that were about this high out of the water, and the water was about oh, a little bit lower than your knee. And so we started walking out there, and we got about 10 feet, and just a black cloud came up. I, you couldn't even hardly see. And we thought, so we started running. And as you were breathing, they would, we would breathe them into our mouth and lungs, and you're trying to wipe them out of the way of your eyes. And I don't know, I guess we ran about 50 yards before we finally got out of it. And that was a long time ago, but that was something that I could relate to these people. These nets, only, I guess they weren't stinging us because some, I guess, can sting you and some can't. But we were running so hard we had to put our hand over like this as we run. Or getting there uh, in our, anyway, that is not a comfortable place to be. So, <clears throat> this plague was caused by the fact that Aaron smote the dust of the ground with his st staff, and all the dust throughout the land of Egypt turned into gnats, which were upon man and beasts. They were everywhere. And of course, the magicians, the wise men, the sorcerers of Egypt, it says in verse 18, and the ma magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not, so there were uh, gnats on man and beast to bring forth gnats. What did that mean? The only thing they could do to counterfeit what God had done was make the plague worse by having more gnats. You don't need more gnats just like you don't need more frogs. So I, I don't believe they were all that popular myself. The fact that, now listen to this. The fact that the thing to be done in this instance was to call creatures into existence and not merely to call forth and change creatures and things that existed already. That's why they couldn't do it. Only God can do that. As in the case of the staff, the water, and the frogs, gnats proceed from the eggs laid in the dust of the earth by the previous generation, and their production is not to be regarded as a direct act of creation any more than that of the frogs. The miracle in both plagues was just the same and consisted not in a direct creation but simply in a sudden creative generation and supernatural multiplication, not of the gnats only, but also of the frogs, in accordance with the previous prediction. That's why they couldn't do it. Only God can make something out of nothing. No person ever, including the angels, can make something out of nothing. Only God can do it. And he did it here in a supernatural multiplication. There were so many gnats, it could drive you crazy. Verse 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, there's more to this verse than meets the eye. They were compelled to acknowledge the finger of God. What is that talking about? Don't let your mind go into the gut. They did not make this acknowledgement for the purpose of giving glory to God himself. Oh, no, they would never do that. But simply to protect their own honor that Moses and Aaron might not be thought to be superior to them in virtue and knowledge. So they didn't care about anything other than uh, saying that it wasn't Moses and Aaron that outdid them. They had to acknowledge that it was the finger of God that he had the power to do it. 
not Moses and Aaron. It didn't really change their their hard heartedness. All it did was show that they were they thought saw this as a competition and they won in their own mind. A distinction was made in the plagues which followed between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And the former were exempted from the plagues. Look again at verse 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. And we're going to see that uh, this, this, this portion is talking about uh, in the next plague, we're going to find that the Israelites would no longer experience the plagues that the Egyptians would. The fourth, and to make this uh, clear, is that the plagues of the see, fourth and fifth plagues were merely announced to uh, by Moses to the king. Uh, they were not brought on through the mediation of either himself or Aaron, but were sent by God at the appointed time. No doubt for the simple purpose of precluding the king and his wise men from the excuse which unbelief might still suggest that they were produced by the power of powerful incant incant uh, incantations of Moses and Aaron. So what I'm saying is you don't have Aaron and Moses in these plagues, the fourth and fifth plagues. Uh, they didn't go through the same process that they did before because the, the king, the, uh, Pharaoh, and his wise men would say, they, they wouldn't say this is coming from God, they would say that it's coming from Moses and Aaron. You understand what I'm saying there? So there there was a, a little bit of difference. There. Verse 20 and 21, we have the fourth plague, which were swarms of insects. Starting with verse 20, fourth plague, swarms of insects. Verse 20 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh as he comes out to the uh, water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of insects on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses of the, in the Houses of the Egyptians shall be of swarms of insects, also the ground on which they dwell. So actually, the swarms of insects were a mixture of different kinds of flies and other insects, more numerous and more annoying than the gnats and the frogs. And they fastened themselves upon the human body, especially upon the edges of the eyelids. And when they stung or bit, it would use, it would leave leave a well. The Septuagint translates the Hebrew word swarms for swarms as a dog fly, a blood sucking insect, and the Incanumon fly, uh, this is another type of insect a fly, is spelled I C H N E U M O N. The incanumon fly, which deposited its eggs on other living things so the larva could feast upon it. This is what they were doing, and they were just covering all of Egypt. Verse 22. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of insects will 
be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord, am in the midst of the land. Verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall occur. So God started exempting from the plague his people. And it was essentially a deliverance for Israel, which manifested the distinction conferred upon Israel above the Egyptians. Now, of course, the Egyptians took partiality to their own, but now God is showing partiality to his own. At least that's one way you can say it. <laughs> Excuse me. Pharaoh was being taught that the Lord who sent the plague was not some deity of Egypt, but the Lord himself was in the midst of the land of Egypt. They were trying everything they could to, to not believe that it was God. And they said, no, it was Moses and Aaron who was doing this. And they were trying to make a case that it was for the, from the gods of Egypt. And it, he was saying clearly here, if you look in verse 23, or verse 22, that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. It wasn't anybody else, it was the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth and is sovereign over the entire universe, was in the land of Egypt causing suffering pain and pain so the people would recognize that their gods were false and the God of Israel is the only true God who is just and righteous as well as gracious and merciful. He was in their land and they were, he was causing a lot of pain and suffering. But it is for a purpose. There's tremendous suffering and pain in the world today and millions of people are also recognizing that the true God is just and righteous as well as gracious and merciful to those who trust in his Son to be saved. So I'm comparing what has happened in the past in this great incidence of the plagues to what's happening now. There's a lot of people suffering in our world and I'm saying that God can use it for good. There have been times when I wondered why God allows horrible suffering and pain that is rampant in the world to continue. Maybe you thought the same, wondered. Maybe it's because many people are so arrogant and stubborn that they must suffer in order to realize who is in charge and there is no one else who can save them physically, but more importantly, who can save them eternally, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The pain and suffering will, can humble a person. And they want out. They want it to stop. And a lot of times they turn to a person or the scriptures and God reveals himself to them. Some people see a comparison between what happened to the Hebrew slaves and what is happening in America. There certainly was a divided kingdom where one side, the Egyptians, had all the power and the Hebrews had none. Sound familiar? The Egyptians used the authoritarian power to subjugate and tyrannize the Hebrews who had done nothing to deserve such treatment. The only hope that the Hebrew people had for deliverance was for God to have mercy on them and end their brutal bondage to people who hated them and hated God as well. Do I need to be more specific? Or are you connecting the dots here? Some might say that our president can be compared to Pharaoh who was overbearing and cruel to the people and that we have many sub-Pharaohs who oppress us 
by ignoring our privacy and taking away our God-given rights. That certainly happened to the Hebrews. We can and should stand for righteousness and refuse to comply with evil. But we must understand that Jesus Christ controls history and only he can deliver us from our bondage and save forever those who put their faith alone in Christ alone. If Jesus Christ is God, and he is, then he not only has the ability, but indeed does control history. And there is suffering and pain and evil on a probably a degree or a level that has been a long time since it's been like this. I can say, and I'm an old goat, that I've never seen it this bad before in my lifetime, and you probably haven't either. So these comparisons that I'm talking about with regard to our situation, I think is legitimate. But we don't have to fret. We don't have to be discombobulated because we're afraid what's going to happen in the future. We know that Jesus Christ controls history. So whatever comes in the future, he brings about. He's perfect and he cannot make a mistake. And we should praise him for whatever the outcome is because whatever it is, it's going to be righteous. It's going to be right. The only hope for the Hebrew people was the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is the same for us today. Only they experienced this for over 400 years. It's been only a couple of years for us, but it seems like maybe 400 years, doesn't it? Verse 24. Then the Lord did so, and there came great swarms of insects into the house of Pharaoh, and the houses of his servants in the land was laid waste because of the swarms of insects in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God. What does it say, that last part? Within the land. Now, why do you suppose that he put that restriction on? I mean, obviously, they are undone. They've gone through all these plagues so far, and they just seem to be keeping, keeping to be uh, even worse. And he is going to relent, but he has to put that little part at the end. The Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. Well, Obviously, he didn't want to let them go. They were producing a lot of labor. And I would say cheap labor. They didn't have any unions. They didn't have anything but just uh, people beating them with a whip every day. And so he didn't want to let them go. Let's see. I, I'm a, I think I have time to do this. We've got five minutes according to this, but I'm not married to the clock. Turn to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78. In verse 42. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 42. You see, the great exodus of the Hebrew children out of Egypt is mentioned several of the places in the Bible. This is one of them. Starting with verse 42 of Psalm 78. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the adversary when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the field of Zoan. 
and turned their rivers into blood and their streams they could not drink. He sent among the swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their crops to the grasshopper and the product of their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hailstones and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave over their cattle also to the hailstones and their herds to bolts of lightning. He sent upon them his burning anger, fury and indignation and trouble, a band of destroying angels. He leveled the path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave over their life to the plague and smote all the firstborn of e born in Egypt, the first issue of their virility in the tents of Ham. But he led forth his own people like sheep, guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them safely to that they did not fear, so that they did not fear. But the sea engulfed their enemies. That's it. That was just a quick little rundown of what God will do. What links he will go in order to protect and preserve his people. And it's my wish, it's my prayer, that whatever it takes to wrench our beloved country from the tyranny we are experiencing today, that he will not lessen in any measure what it will take to get our freedom than he did with the Hebrew children in Exodus. Well, whether he will do it or not is up to him. But again, we will glorify and and praise him for what he does. Because our his love for us is undiminished. And he even loves those who are wrecking havoc, havoc on our country. But he knows exactly what needs to be done. He has the power to do it. And we look to him for our deliverance. It has always been that way and will always be that way. Because it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has saved us eternally. And now we're praying that he will save us physically and in time. The last portion of this service has to do with those who hear these words and they might be mixed up as to what's going to happen. Specifically, it's not complicated. It's the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He's the Son of God. He died for our sins, which means we're not going to hell for sins anyway, so you quit worrying about that. You go to hell for rejecting the sacrifice of Christ for us on the cross. He died and rose from the grave and he offers eternal life to anyone who will put their faith alone in Christ alone. And he only gives it as a gift. You cannot earn it. I would say that if you don't understand that, if you didn't understand that before, or you're trying to work your way to heaven, whatever it might be, God is the God of grace. He is in charge. The only thing we can do to be saved is to humble ourselves and depend upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our eternal salvation. And the moment you come to that place, then you are born again you become a royal family member of the Most High. And there's no question that you are going to heaven. You can have that peace. Let's close. 
Heavenly Father, we are in awe of the omnipotent power that you have illustrated in the exodus of the Hebrew people. They still suffer today. They've suffered all along because Satan wants to wipe them out. We pray that you will give us the courage, the peace of mind, the security, confidence, all the things that people hope for, we can have through you. You are the one that gives them to us. Times are probably going to get darker, maybe much darker. Help us to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and praise him for whatever he is doing, for he is going to bring it out for good. And we thank you for this, and we pray it in his name.